from Washington, D.C., it's The Cube, covering .next Conference. Brought to you by Nutanix. Welcome back to DC, everybody. This is The Cube, the leader in live tech coverage. This is our special coverage and presentation of Nutanix, NextConf 2017. This is the third US conference that The Cube has done of uh, Nutanix.next. Uh, Nicholas Radford is here as the Senior Vice President of Engineering and the CTO at Houston Mechatronics. Wait till you hear what these guys do. And Satya Vagani, who is the VP of Technology at Nutanix. Gentlemen, welcome to theCUBE. Glad to be here, right, Nick. Let's get right into it. Yep. We're talking IOT, we're talking edge. You guys do some pretty interesting stuff. Tell us about the company. Well, we're robotics as a service company primarily, but we do uh, some intelligent automation and intelligent drilling in, in, uh, in the IOT space. So it's uh, it's it's pretty exciting and dynamic area actually, and and uh, just imagine taking a bunch of different systems that uh, haven't typically talked together before, and we've kind of glued them all together. And and uh, and one of the big oil uh, field services companies uh, was attracted to our, our sort of thinking in this area, and uh, have, have taken some uh, given us some work, and um, you know we're, we're taking uh, taking and running with it. Yeah, can you just explain what robotics as a service means? Yeah. Well. Usually, uh, you know, there, you can kind of break this down in a couple different ways. You know, there's a lot of people out there that sell robots, and and it's kind of a thin business, right? You know, you might sell a robot, and then uh, the, the people you sell it to use it and make a bunch of money off of it, and then you're starting, you know, you're stuck trying to find a new customer to sell a robot to. But if you consume the robots, so to speak, that you build and and then use them as a service, it's a much more lucrative position to have. And so we do uh, technology systems development for for partners and then we also operate that robot in the field for them. So it's a good residual pull through revenue stream for us. So Satyam, the, the, the industrial technology world, the information technology worlds are coming crashing together. Absolutely. You know, IT and OT. Nutanix has been talking about the edge more and more. I mean, if you're not talking about the edge, you know, I'm not in the game, but give us an update on your strategy with regard to the edge and, and really you're thinking about companies uh, like like Nick's. I know, great question. Uh, I guess I have so much to tell. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, make it edgy. Make it edgy. Right. Like, yeah. Uh, but yeah, I, I guess we kind of sort of nat naturally fell into it because we saw that the future of computing might be more edgy, <laughs> if you will, than, uh, than we think. As you know, uh, right now we are spending a lot of time and energy worrying about clouds, you know, private cloud, public cloud, how, how to consolidate them. But then, at the same time, we are seeing that there's so many of these sensors being deployed in the world just this year. It's going to be roughly eight and a half billion sensors, if you count consumer and industrial IoT together. By 2020, it's going to be 20 billion sensors. And so all the data that these sensors are going to generate is going to be processed in real time, closer to where the sensors create the data, as opposed to slightly farther away, which is in the cloud. Of course, the cloud remains relevant, is the cloud is going to do much more longer term processing, and the edge is going to do real time, process, real -time processing on the data. Right. And so, in that sense, we saw that as a natu natural step two of the hyperconvergence journey, is if you think about step one of hyperconvergence as the convergence of compute, storage, and network resources inside a data center. Step two is the convergence of the edge and the cloud into one fabric, one OS, if you will. Yeah, I wonder if you could help us unpack that a little, because we saw kind of public cloud pulled at the data center for years, yeah. and now the edge is pulling out the cloud. So back the out. edge is different from the data center, so most people think of Nutanix, you know, I'm either living in a data center or maybe some service provider, so, you know, it's different form factor, I know, I know there's some announcements Nutanix made to kind of get to robo cases, is that the same for the edge? Yeah, different form factors, because you know, some of this hardware needs to be ruggedized, you know, it's on oil rigs or drones or military vehicles and so on. Uh, but also a uh, slightly different and evolving storage stack, because now the problem of deploying applications at the edge is about developers having to write code and not having to worry about how the code runs on the edge, because as soon as they have to worry about that, developers become operators, infrastructure operators, and so, this one will also have a slightly higher level of application stack, you know, machine learning services or analytic services at the edge so that applications can directly consume those higher level services as opposed to the lower level, you know. Which actually, that's, uh, it's, it's really intriguing because 
uh, as part of our robotics as a service side of our business, uh, we have a, a pipe inspection system that we're going to be uh, deploying in quantity. And so what you, that, that's, a, that's a type of edge device, right? That's, that's a, that's a, I mean, robots are really nothing more than fancy data collection systems, right? And so we put them out into the world to collect the data, but then what do you do with that data? How is it stored? What sort of post analytics are you doing on that data to then feed forward back to the intelligence at the edge so that they can make decisions better, right? So when you have a, uh, our, our robot, uh, what we call Pearl, a pipe inspection robot, you'll actually see a demo of it later, fingers crossed. As it's traveling through the pipe, it's collecting all this data, right? So, but all of the runs prior to that, it's afforded all of that knowledge on the decisions it's making right then and there, right? Because we've done all this back learning, if you will, on what deformities look like, which increases the quality of our inspections. And so then if you start looking at a ubiquitous deployment of these type of assets, where you might have 10, 20, 30 in the field, that's a massive amount of data that you're collecting right there, right where the sensor's being taken. The processing of that data is determining whether the robot stops and maybe observes a little bit more, but then it's all being shipped back at a later date to the cloud for further analytics, then to feed forward in the next operation to perform that better. So it's this feedback process of learning between the, the application that's actually happening in real time and the later on analytics that will occur. So let's, keep, let's stay on the data for a moment, because uh, it is all about the data. Uh, is it correct that much of the data in your world is, is analog data that you're, you're able to now con convert yeah, into digital yeah. or, yeah, or so are you I mean, already there? At, at, at the end of the day, you're, you're trying to take an analog measurement of some type, right? We live in an analog world and, and if I'm trying to measure the thickness of a pipe, I'm, us I'm using a transducer yeah. that by nature is typically an analog device. I can then digitize that information and that's how I send it over in, in you know, communication streams and whatnot. And of course it's stored digitally. But at the end of the day, you know, we're taking analog information, doing data processing on that, looking at what it means in the activity that we're trying to do, measuring the, the thickness of a tube. And then we ship the data back at a, at a more convenient time where we have more bandwidth back to the cloud for all of the deep learning, deep type of analytics. Nicholas, could, could you kind of explain that, uh, kind of your stack. I was hoping you were going to explain it to me. Um, because how did you get to Nutanix? Uh, you know, what goes into what public cloud, what services are you using there? If it, whatever you could share. Well, we're kind of we're to involved understand. with Nutanix yeah. on our, our rig automation side. Yeah. And uh, so we, uh, we use their, 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 uh, their storage, um, you know, we use their storage in the way that they, they've, they've created an excellent way of doing that. And so that's, that's primarily how we interface with them and one of our big oil and gas partners is a huge client of theirs. And so um, you know, that's, that's our primary relationship with them. In fact, I sent, uh, I sent Rich a picture of a, of a Nutanix box that we just recently installed in our server room and I was like, you know, give him the thumbs up and I was like, hey buddy, you know. All right, and, and public cloud, uh, you know, do, do you have a specific one you're using, you're using many clouds? Or? No, 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 I mean, uh, for, for the processing of data, you saying some of it goes to the public cloud, though. It just yeah, no, I mean it's 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 more of the local area. I mean this is the stuff we're using internal. I mean this is this is the security requirements that we have is, is so your cloud is an on-prem cloud. Yeah, exactly. Okay. okay. How much of the data? I mean, I know it can't be precise, but if you think about all this real-time decision making that you're doing. How much of the data is actually going to go back to the cloud? I mean, it's even in rough percentage terms. I want well, we'd like opinions. to send it all back, right? It's 100%. Just, it's, it's just what you don't send then and there, right? There's a, there might be a little stream of it coming back off of, let's say, our, our pipe inspection robot. But at, at some point, though, you want to take that, download everything, store it back up. I mean, it's in all the big data analytic, analytic techniques and, and analyze it. I mean, you know. So you won't, per, you, you, you expect you want to persist the majority of the data, uh, and you ultimately will not do that at the edge. You'll ultimately have yeah, to get it back up absolutely. to the cloud. Yeah, that's that's the way we see. You're going to use the Chevy you truck. Have a you use the Chevy truck access method to get <laughs> it there. Or Go ahead, please. As a, I have a different opinion, kind of sort of a similar principle, but a different opinion, which is, you know, in terms of volume, a very small fraction of the data is going to make it to the cloud. Now, in terms of intelligence, you know, almost 100 percent of the intelligence is going to make it, but it is how the edge participates in reducing the volume of the data. You know, just again, to give you numbers, you know, in the year 2020, it's projected, and this is, I think, the Cisco Global Cloud Index. They project that roughly 600 zettabytes of data is going to be created on the edge. 
and the public and private cloud combined in that year is going to roughly witness 15 zettabytes of data. Yeah. And so the question is, well, where did the rest of it go? And I think my answer is, if you look at, for example, a smart building or a robot inspection uh, kind of scenario, the robots taking pictures or video streams, which is ridiculously rich data, and changing it into a time series database of whether some anomaly was detected or not. You look at a smart airport example, we're going to take a lot of surveillance data and change it into whether a person of interest was detect, detected or not. Or did you see a white van that you're looking for? And, and so really the, the information, the volume of information goes down, but the refinement goes up. Is, you know, the cloud really is interested to know, because you know, presumably in the smart ex airport example, you have somebody sitting at, a, sitting at a dashboard monitoring all California airports, looking for a person of interest, and all they are worried about is whether some, somebody showed up or not. And so it's the metadata that shows up as opposed to the raw data. So the needles go back. Needles yeah. go back, exactly. Okay. That's a good way to put it, not the haystack. Yeah. Nicholas, one of the things we look at IoT is it's really created uh, a, a much larger, I mean, orders of magnitude more surface area uh, for security attacks. Is that something that, that concerns you, your clients, you know? It concerns our clients yeah. very much so, absolutely. In fact, one of the first one of the first questions out of everybody's mouth is how are you going to handle security? So it's, 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 it's paramount and, and very important. Yeah. Absolutely. All right, so Satchim, how are you going to solve that? Well, the running joke is blockchain. <laughs> and you know, people stop asking questions as soon as you say blockchain. <laughs> but no, it's, it's an unbelievable uh, problem. In fact, something that probably we haven't uh, you know, kind of solved in generations. We are struggling with cloud security, with cyber security, and now we are talking about a number of devices that's going to be three orders of magnitude more than the number of servers that run in the cloud today. What about, one of the things we haven't talked about is connectivity. How do you connect the edge? Is it just all wireless? Is it yeah, I mean, the, the, the ubiquity of the wireless networking systems are very high right now. I mean, it's all... How's the quality? Uh, you know, good. It's like wireless. <laughs> it's like wireless. Is it a, but is it a headwind? No, it's actually, it's a, you know, one of, uh, one of the issues that we're having with, uh, honestly, our, our uh, pipe inspection demonstration today is just being flooded. There's so many, there's 4,000 people in, in the main hall, right? And, and so there's all this wireless activity and sometimes, you know, our pipe inspection robot doesn't know who it should be quite listening to. And I mean, you know, that you go to a concert and you look like you might head to a Metallica concert here and there. And, I do. And uh, you know, you, sometimes you can't even send a text because there's just so many people and trying to connect and, and it's, it's a big deal, so. So it's a challenge for you. Yeah, absolutely, it's a challenge. Yeah. Excellent. I've seen uh, some vendors, they are deploying special networks, right? They are deploying low bandwidth networks. Verizon's doing it, I think. Yeah, AT&T okay. is doing it. Uh, no pineapples. Uh, no pineapples, <laughs> yeah, hopefully. That's like the most recent uh, Silicon Valley uh, episode, right? <laughs> All right, gentlemen, listen, thanks very much. Really appreciate you coming on theCUBE. Thanks Great for having story us. and use cases. It's uh, always a pleasure. Thanks, Satya. Good, good luck All with right. the demo. Yeah. All right, yep. keep right See there, you. buddy. We'll be back with our next guest. It's theCUBE. We're live from Nutanix, NextConf. We'll be right back.